Welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast, the show that talks culture and leadership in sports with some of the most compelling coaches, athletes, and business people in the world. I am your host, Colin Cernelia, and thank you for joining us today. Be sure to check out the show notes for any additional information you want to know about this episode, and you can also find my contact information if you'd like to say hi. If you aren't driving or in the middle of a run, please consider taking a minute and leaving us a review of the show on Apple Podcasts. This is the best way to help other folks find the show. And if you're feeling extra generous, hit share on this episode and post it to your social media handles. Thank you, as always, for all of the support. Don't forget, if you haven't already, to check out my Amazon best-selling book, Culture of Excellence, What We Can Learn from the Yankees About Leadership. This book is a fun and informative read that is filled with impactful stories that will become value adds to your life. I'm a little biased, but seriously, it's a transformative book. You can find that, training notebooks, swag, and information on the Leadership Academy workshop and trainings all in the show notes or go to talent409.com. All right, we are here today with Jessica Kern Huff. Jessica is a mother, coach, motivational speaker, so much more. We are going to get into all of that in our conversation today. And Jessica, I think when I was getting ready for our conversation today, the number one thing I kept coming back to was the positivity that you radiate all the time. Like when we had our first conversation on the phone, I got off that phone. I went <laughs> right, right. It's my wife's office. I was like, Oh my God, I just had the greatest conversation with Jessica. I feel so great. So jazzed up, so energized. So I'd love to ask you, you know, that feel good, that, that feeling that you get when people interact with you. I think that's a special thing. Where does that start for you? Like, where does that positivity come from? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of do this backwards. Um, okay. first of all, let me just thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I can't, I can't do this enough. Um, just because I feel like it's what people genuinely need. Um, my positivity, I'm going to be honest with you comes from people telling me I can't, it, it comes <laughs> from motivation. It comes from doors being closed. Um, I was raised in a blue collar family. And you just point blank, period, get it done. Like, that's it. No excuses. You get it done. And eventually I got, I realized that, and I actually realized this really early in life, like life's going to hurt at some point. It is going to absolutely suck. And the choice to get out the bed and keep moving is just a really simple choice that has nothing to do with how much money you have in your bank account. It has everything to do with opportunity. And when that light switch turned on, and I'm not going to say that choosing joy doesn't hurt either, because that does. But if you have a choice to be ahead of the game in the beginning of the day, I think you've got a shot. And I spent way too many days thinking about what wasn't, and I had to figure out what was, and it made life a little easier. So essentially, you're saying there was a time where you know, maybe the the way that you go about living your life these days and the interactions that you have as a result of that and the opportunities that come as a result of that, it wasn't always like that. That was something that you had to work on. It's not like it was something that was just maybe natural within you. No, I was always a self-starter. Let me say that. Um, my dad and I laugh about this all the time because, um, you know, I was a crammer. All my college students out there, please don't listen to this message. But I was a crammer. So I would get up at three in the morning. And I, because I, I, w- I had like, I, I had photographic memory. So I had to study right before I either took a test to make it all make sense. Same thing as a coach. I, that's why I always had my scouting report and laminated play card in my hand. I'm a visual learner. I have to see it. And I think that's why I was able to adapt with my players later on collegiately, because it was remind, 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 right? And so, but I knew I was a self-starter. I didn't like leaving the gym until I accomplished something. I didn't like leaving the weight room if I couldn't max out on that day or I didn't get better. I am learning now at 40 years old, everybody doesn't have that. Um, But I do think that if you have the ability to outwork life, outwork your opponent, outwork your circumstance, you've got a shot. You've really got a shot. And so I do want to say I was a self-starter early and very self-motivated early, but 
as early as a year ago, which is crazy because we're at one year from the horrible tornado tornadoes that hit Nashville. Just about a year ago, I was in a place where I was at a crossroads and I had to really decide did I want to choose my version of joy or did I want to choose on paper and a resume what was other people's version of joy? Sure. Yeah. And, and I love just the self-awareness to know, like, it doesn't seem like you just figured this out a year ago, but you know, there are always, like you said, there's always going to be things, I think difficulties in life, situations that pop up, really hard decisions that you have to make. And, you know, if you have this foundational lifestyle, like it seems that you have, you know, I think that in a lot of ways makes it easier to navigate through those tough times and get back to a, a place of peace, if you will. For sure. For sure. Hope is, um, hope is real. Like hope is, can ignite like any fire. You know, I think as a country, we've been living in hope, right? Hope that that pandemic will end. Hope that we have just a a change of leadership, no matter what side of the fence that you stand on, something different. Um, A hope for new careers, a hope that, okay, all this grind um, wasn't in vain. You know, hope can drive a lot of things. And right now we're in a basketball, we're going into March Madness and you know what? There was a lot of prayer, a lot of wishing, a lot of hoping, but there's going to be some teams standing and we need to see it. Yes, absolutely. So then I follow you on social media. And one of the things I see all the time is you have the hashtag right foot, left foot. Is that like the simplicity of, of this all? Like just put one foot in front of the other and let's get through the day. Yes. And so um, I'm praying if I say this enough at some point, Candace Parker, reach out to me um, because she, a couple of years ago, she got a tattoo and I was like, and, and obviously it was honoring Pat Summit, right? Mm-hmm. Left foot, right foot, exhale. And I took that and sort of kind of made it my own. And sometimes you literally have to just put one foot in front of the other. And, and it's hard. It's really hard. There are days we've all been there that you just don't want to get out the bed. You don't want to do that workout. You don't want to take that interview. You don't want to go to that job. But sometimes the process is just that. It's the process. And just putting one foot in front of the other is everything. And I actually, um, to put this on a personal note, um, I've had family members that have been intimately affected by COVID. And just being able to put one foot in front of the other down the hospital hallway is everything. So that's what that means. Just keep sure. going. Yeah. Yeah. That's really powerful, especially when you compare it to something as deadly and catastrophic as COVID has turned out to right. be here. So a lot of my inclination from this part of the conversation has led me. And, and I think this happens every time I talk to people who are high performers like yourself is how do you, live the way that you do and avoid burnout like that that's like what you were talking about getting up early like it's reminding me of one of my best friends from high school he was our valedictorian and uh, just you know super smart bright guy he's a plant manager the you know these days still just same type of attitude that you have and I always wonder about the burnout factor I'm like how does he do it day after day so I would love to learn a little bit from you like how you avoid that and it, maybe if there were any scenarios where you had it in the past and what you learned from it oh yeah oh yeah um people always ask me why I made my transition um from um track and field to basketball and I had reached um burnout with track and field. So I am a, I'm a very mental person. I believe if your psyche is there, your body will go. Right. And I always use that on the court with my, with my teams. They're just like, coach, I'm tired. I was like, nah, you're not tired. Your body's tired, but your mind's ready to rock, you know? (laughs) And so, um, that's sort of the, 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 the mentality I took over to life. I knew it was My track and field journey was coming to an end because it mentally became very difficult, right? Uh, I I knew I was the best jumper on the runway, but there would always be something meticulous that I would find. I would find something, this has to be better, that has to be better. And I would psych myself out of jumps, right? I would scratch jumps that were easy. And I'm like, this was supposed to be fun at some point. Like I used to love doing this, but with basketball, the scenario changed in an instant, right? Offense to defense. You're only good as your last play, making a stop, getting a rebound. There was always something that I could pour myself into to move on to the next. And so taking that over to life, 
we all get to a point where we're at our breaking point, right? This is the life and the balance component. I will be completely honest in telling you before I was a mother, I did not understand it. I push myself to all my fans out there and people that say you look so great on the sideline. I was so small while I was coaching. People thought I was lean, but the reality was I wasn't eating. I was three cups of coffee in the morning, grab a quick, you know, a, a apple and orange, another two cups of coffee, work out in between. And before I knew it, I was like, I'm not the same size I was in high school. Like, are you kidding me? You know, and there was no balance. There was no balance. So what I've learned to do, depending on where you are in your life, sometimes you work in your corporation, your company, your university for a boss that allows you to have vacations. And let's be very candid. Some people don't. I have learned to take many vacations in my mind and with my body and with my spirit to find balance. My son knows if I give the one finger, the church finger, you know, the usher finger, that means I'm tapping out. (laughs) I am over it. This is getting too grown for me. I am done. (laughs) And so right now during the pandemic, I make sure in every day, my face has to hit the sun. I don't care if it's a rainy day. I don't care. I have to go outside. My face has to hit the sun. I have to feel the environment because the walls start to close in. That's rough, right? Sure, sure, sure. Um, football, right? So my husband's a football coach and we've learned on the calendars because it used to be really, really hard with basketball and football because July was my peak recruiting period. And then here he goes with spring ball for football and we would never take a vacation. Well, we, we're stealing our weeks. So we have non-negotiables, no matter what jobs we take or where we're at. These are those two weeks that we're taking family time, one-on-one time, and then individual time. And for anybody that needs to hear this, as much as you love your life partner, you got to get away from them sometimes too. (laughs) And he takes his golf trip. I take my girls trip and it works out, you know? So you do get to a breaking point. I think athletics teaches us to push so hard that you forget to stop. And you have to really stop. And so for me, it did get to burnout with coaching sometimes mentally. For for me, it started track and field wise, from track and field to basketball. That was one very important pillar in my life. And then just recently with coaching, I realized that if my mental didn't go, my physical wasn't going to go and I was no good to my family. So I had to learn seriously in this last year how to steal your moments. And you've got to learn to do that. And sometimes it's not a fantastic vacation to the Bahamas. It could just be in your backyard, but you have to take those moments. So powerful. And I encourage people who are listening to this, go back and listen to this again, because it probably hit you hard the first time. Listen to what Jessica just said again. Like I'm already excited to go back and edit this episode so I can (laughs) hear it again myself. That was so great. And I appreciate you sharing all of that. You mentioned athletics and so natural segue i'd love to just learn a little bit you know how you first got involved in athletics i mean we we talked about the transition i guess we can get to there in a second from track and field to basketball but uh you one of our common ties is penn state so how did you uh get into track and field and athletics in general when you were a kid that ultimately took you to penn state yeah my dad was the founder of the milwaukee striders track club which is still going on in milwaukee wisconsin him and joe sims um god rest his soul And so I started running from age five. Um, And I still think I'm running, to be very honest with you. (laughs) Um, But at the end of the day, um, it just shows you a discipline. You know, I um, ran track, played soccer, played volleyball. um, But my dad threw me in everything. Tennis, you know, um, just to try to figure out what my love was. I swore I was going to be a college quarterback. That was going to be my thing. I was going to be a female quarterback. Um, and then I realized I don't like getting hit like that. Like, don't, that's too much. You, you touch my face, you know? Um, but my, my dad introduced me to sports and it just gave me this different discipline. And I want people to know this, the confident woman you see now, that was not me. That was not me growing up. I'm a biracial kid. So, um, again, shout out to all my mixed breeds out there because sometimes you struggle, you struggle with, are, are you black enough? You know, I'm, I'm not really white. What am I in the middle? What crowd do I fit in with? My skin looks a little different. My hair looks a little different. Um, and then kids are mean. Like kids are mean. And, and you try to figure it out. Um, and so sports gave me a voice. 
I realized the better I became in sports, the more popular I became and people like to listen to the popular kid. (laughs) And that gave me my voice. And then I realized, okay, if you're going to talk, if you're going to be captain, if you're going to be a leader, you have to know what you're saying. And so I didn't want to be the cute girl. I didn't. I wanted to be the girl that was heard. That was really important for me. And so the better I got in athletics, the more muscles I got, the more confident I got, it all works itself together. That is why I'm so big on pushing sports, especially with young women, because I truly believe it gave me my life, literally. And I love seeing that in other young women. And I'm, I'm doing that with my eight-year-old son right now. I'm watching him grow as a young man and sports has a big part to do with that. Yeah. And, and I love the examples that you gave about just how sports provided that platform and how you took it upon yourself to make that determination that being popular was one thing, right? Like that was the first step to having a true platform, I guess, but being popular, being cute, you know, some of these things that maybe are just more surface level than anything else wasn't as important to you as actually being a leader, actually having a message that can motivate people. Do you see that you know, with, with the girls that you're working with or coming across these days where they're either struggling to identify that or they're struggling with how to break that apart. Because like, you know, I, even being a guy growing up when I was a teenager, like you, you just want to fit in. And, and then you realize when you're older in life, you're like, no, nah, fitting in is a kind of overrated, you know, at, at some point. So uh. I, I, let me tell you something. I struggle with the amount of pulls that young people have on their spirits now. Yeah. Like you have so much more access to vanity than I did growing up. And I think the comparison game is the worst game that you can possibly play. Sure. You're comparing yourself to things that you see, other people, other people's successes. Their journey is not your journey. It, it wasn't meant to be that way. Um, and so I do feel like, and, and coaches and even parents, I, I pray that you hear this. Our young people across the board are struggling with just their identity as well as confidence. And I think that's been manifested by what they see, not necessarily in the household, but the access they have to so many vain things right now. So um, I know it's something I struggled with. I know when I was coaching collegiately, it was a very big issue amongst my young women. Hence the reason for those people that follow me, food and fellowship is important to me. I feel like the, the wall is broken down over a plate of spaghetti. I feel like you you let some of your, your burdens go a little bit when you feel like you're at home. Um, and that's why I employ to my coaches. And I have no problem saying this. I have no problem saying this to my husband. If you want them to play for you, they have to believe in you. It's really important. Yeah, I think that's a great, great uh, one of my favorite quotes is actually a Joe Paterno quote. It's uh, believe deep down that you're destined to do great things. That like, word believe like always triggers that quote in my mind and um yeah i think it's it's really powerful especially from like a a relationship standpoint like kids are smart right like they can see phoniness from a thousand miles away so like if if you as the adult don't have it together i just think it's almost nearly impossible to like truly build the type of culture that you've wanted to build like for your teams and that your husband's trying to build for his teams etc like you just i just feel like you can't be an effective leader if people can't believe in you i agree totally so um you had mentioned uh just race growing up and um you know i don't know if it's a is it a big like topic of conversation for you these days like how important is it for for you to like have those conversations with your son for example and um you know talk about you know the the difficulties with race in this country and um you know maybe some of the experiences that you and your husband have had as a result of that and uh trying to educate um, him for what's unfortunately ahead, but hopefully changing as, as we are changing as a society. Yeah. I think the world has been so heavy, right? It's been so heavy. Like we're carrying this burden, um, on our shoulders. And we had to realize as a family that BJ is still eight. So the capacity of an eight-year-old is just that it's the capacity (laughs) of an eight-year-old, but we're very honest and open with him about life. You know what, baby, our skin is brown. And there are just some things that brown skin people have to do a little different. But what does not change is this is why we out-educate. 
This is why we outwork. This is why we outgrind. This is why the right way is the right way to have a shot to be a difference maker. Um, sure, have we had to teach lessons a little bit early? For sure. Um, but is it something that I am so grateful that I have a husband who hits the nail directly on the head? I'm the buffer, okay? <laughs> Dad is, you know, he's a straight shooter. And so, um, but we do, we, we do pride ourselves on doing things a little bit different. Um, and we don't want to sugarcoat things. And there are some things that BJ does not understand. But the premise that we come back to is number one, our faith that's unwavering. It's a non-negotiable. And we go back onto this is why there's a power bigger than us, BJ, because there are some things that mommy at 40 years old does not understand. But what we can do is pray that we leave with love. And so, yes, have, have I put my hands on my family probably more in this last year with intentional prayer? No question about it. Um, do I think, do I truly believe that this world is going to eventually be a better place in a better place than we were a year ago? I do. I really do because I believe in the God that we serve. And I know that we cannot continue to live in this form of existence. This isn't living. We're existing. And so, um, I just choose to lead with love. And the cool part about athletics and moving with coaching is he has met and has friends in every color, every creed, every socioeconomic platform. That's what makes it cool. It's because athletics is like that binding force. Kids don't care who they pass the ball to when they're eight. <laughs> they don't care what you look like when they go play at your house. So right. we as somewhere as adults get tainted. Right. And so we're just trying to keep him, um, keep it honest and organic with him, but allow him to, to lead with love. And, and I pray that in the end, um, that all works out in his favor. Sorry to interrupt, but I want to help you get fit. Christine here from Sweat with Sods. Being at home has a lot of people in a rut with their workouts, but you don't have to be. My Hit at Home workouts require no equipment and can be done in 30 minutes or less. And if Hit isn't for you, I also design custom programs that can be done virtually, in person, or a combination of both. I put my years of experience teaching classes and personal training into all of my programs. I've worked with lots of people and helped them achieve very different goals. So what are you waiting for? Head to sweatwithstats.com today. And don't forget that as a listener to this podcast, you can get a discount with code DYNAMIC at checkout. Can't wait to hear from you. And now, back to the show. Uh, one of the interesting things that you had mentioned, I guess it's unsurprising to me that you have enjoyed basketball as like a second career in sports because it, it's almost like a, it's a game of process, right? Like you talked about how you're only as good as the last play. So if you need to get a stop, then you need to get the rebound. Then you need to dribble the ball up court. Then you need to hit the shot. Like it yeah. all works in, in one motion. We had talked about earlier in the conversation, like just about how the process for you is very important just to your daily success. So um, how do you, you know, from like a, I guess more of a strategical, like teaching standpoint, like if we just stick with basketball, for example, yeah. how do you get players to believe in that process? Like on the court, that everything is so interconnected like that uh, and that you have to work together as a team. Cause I think basketball is like a really great example for so many things like teamwork and communication. Yeah. And it's such a fast moving game as well. So I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from this. Yeah. It's no surprise that good people make good players. <laughs> right. It really goes hand in hand. Think about anybody that you truly admire and, and you listen to them on interviews and you're, not, you're just locked in, right? Because yeah. you really are intrigued to hear what they have to say. So especially to my mid-major coaches out there, my low-major coaches, it is a task. You may get the kid um, that the resources of a, of a larger institution, i.e. a Penn State University, people are paid to get certain levels of student athletes, right? So here's a psychotherapist and this is a nutritionist and this is, you know, you have an individual tutor versus a study hall, right? Um, but I truly believe if you turn and, and, and I love, let me say this, Joni Taylor at Georgia, um, shout out to her, coach of the year, well-deserving, a woman of class, a woman of grace. But the one thing she said last week is she's like, there's a certain type of student athlete that we want. And we want high character individuals. That is extremely important. That is the same thing that my husband said at the press conference. Um, obviously, as you know, we're at Marshall University now, high character kids, 
high character kids, high character kids make high character plays. It all goes hand in hand at the end of the day. Um, and that's when you get to take your blind eye to the locker room. Right. And so, um, being a good person matters. It matters. Look at how many programs right now who have been able to sustain during a pandemic. It's not just about playing. It's about being a good person. Yeah. And you know what? The way is the way. The right way is the right way. Lavelle um, at uh, North Carolina Central. His story is insane. It's insane. But he keeps coming out prevailing and his players mimic him because he's a good character guy. And so it's important. It's really important. And for coaches out there, I promise you, call me if you need to do budget line modifications and try to figure out how you can get the most out of your players with a small budget. You can do it. But the infrastructure has to be in place because you can't expect them to be dynamic on game day when they really don't believe in the foundation of the building that you're building. You cannot build a building on a cracked surface. That's just not going to work. So um, I think it's extremely important. And yeah, I get it. There's some people out there who are phenomenal athletes and on their worst day, you've got to work three times as harder, to, you know, to just get to where they are. But from a sustainability standpoint, and I'm telling you as now an old person, it <laughs> matters. It really, really matters. <laughs> that is so great. And I think, again, this is one of the areas where I want to encourage people to go back and listen to this again, because it just makes so much sense. Like it's very simple. And I know a lot of times we try to, I think we try to make things overly complicated, but I think the process here is simple. Now I do want to try and get a little complicated with this and just ask you a one-off question related to it. Do you think that it's possible to take, you know, let's say, let's say an, an adult. So somebody who's 18 years old entering into college or somebody who has graduated college and is entering into the corporate world, you know, from a cultural standpoint, you talk about high character kids are high character performers. Is it possible to coach up the character piece while you're trying to do the thing that either makes your team go or makes your company go, or is that something that, you know, you can only afford to have maybe one or two bad eggs. Um, and, and cause everyone else will help bring them up. But you know, once you start getting more than that, it's really going to crack that foundation that you were talking about. Oh yeah. I'm a realist. Like at the end of the day, if you don't have kids that can put the ball in the basket, uh, you're not going to be coaching for long. <laughs> right. I mean, that's just the truth, but, but at the end of the day, um, this is the relationship piece that you have to know what you're getting yourself into. Um, I have had players, they know exactly who they are. I've had to put a sticky note in your pocket. I've had to put a sticky note on your locker. You have to see my face on game day. I have to make eye contact with you. I have to hold you when everybody else leaves the huddle and say, did you understand? Do, what do you need? What's your question? That is knowing your players at the end of the day. Can sure. you build a team with a bunch of ad bad eggs? No. You cannot. At some point, pride. At some point, cockiness. At some point, the, the, the conflict and the friction of all of those things bumping heads is going to implode. It's going to. Um, but you have to have pieces of the puzzle that work very well together. The more leaders you have on a program, the better. Now, let me also give an asterisk and say this. The older we get, it is harder to find true leaders because it's not a class that you take in high right. school, right? right? That's what, I don't know about you, but Ms. Branson at Washington High School, she was my guidance counselor, but she was my life coach. She taught me about life. Like it all made sense. Well, budgets are getting cut. School districts are getting cut. And that pouring into leadership in life is, meant, is, is becoming minimal. That's why it's so important as coaches and college administrators, let me holler at you as well. Pay your coaches their worth, please. Yeah. Pay them their worth. Why? Because at this point in the game, it's gone beyond X's and O's. You are now paying life coaches. You are paying mentors. Sometimes you are paying father and mother figures to be there for these student athletes in the duration they're at your institution of higher learning. So it's really, really important. I would say if you can get a good split, if you can find your way to get a split of athleticism, a split of the kid that you know is going to do this stuff the right way, period, and they just outwork and work hard, because that's going to be the get your jersey dirty kid. Yeah. And then you've got your studs intermingled somewhere in there that you know they've got support systems from all sides, just in case you have to save them from themselves. You're going to be in the fight when it's all said and done. Yeah, I love it. And 
you know, you talk about going the extra mile, identifying different types of, you know, sometimes you have to lead in a different way for different types of individuals. And, and that can be on the collective as a team aspect too. So uh, I don't know if you can disclose this, but I'm just really sure. curious now that you talked about the sticky notes, what were on some of those sticky notes that oh, you stuck huge, in the pockets? I'm, yeah, I'm huge <laughs> on quotes, um, but I'm a numbers person. So my dad's a math teacher. He still teaches um, at Milwaukee area um, technical college um, in Milwaukee, um, does it extend it, um, adult education in math. And so with that being said, I'm a numbers person. Numbers don't lie. So I have a player who's playing professionally right now. And I know she doesn't mind me saying her name, Tia Wooten um, from Tennessee State University. Um, to date, Tia will text me from Romania, because that's where she is right now. And she'll say, if I have what by half, am I being efficient? Okay, Tia, let me do the math. And so I would give her sticky notes before games, quotes before games. I had players who had lost very close family members. What is your why? When it gets hard, when it gets difficult, remember your why. Um, players that are hitting milestones, you know, coaches want to believe that players are not counting points. Okay, now that we're <laughs> over that, it happens because they, they don't put in all this work to not celebrate the big moments, right? Sure, sure. And so, hey, kid. You got 12 this half. If you can give me another good 15, touching the paint, we got a shot, you know? And so kids need to hear that kind of stuff every once in a while. You know, I love when a player comes to the sideline and a coach takes their head and whispers something in their ear because that's the relationship that only that player and coach has. Nobody else is going to know it. They're not going to understand it. But trust me when I tell you and you hear a, co and you hear a kid say, yes, coach. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Big things are about to happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm big on the sticky notes. Technology wise, I've had to learn, to, oh, my God, the group me and the group chat and, the, you know, <laughs> but kids need that's the confidence piece. They need ongoing validation and motivation. And if you for a second as an adult think they don't think about how we struggle with it. Yeah. So Absolutely. we have to go back to when we were 18. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good good reminder when you think about those days for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Jessica, you uh, are the the founder of, of your own uh, foundation. Sorry that those words kind of uh, intertwine there, but the, the Jessica Kern Foundation, and um, you know, obviously we've talked about oh, your your husband being a, a Division One head coach, and your your mother as well, and so many other things. Um, I would love to just talk a little bit. Um, a little bit about balance um, in managing your time. I know we touched on this a little bit earlier in the conversation, but I think a lot of times when people hear balance, they think like, oh, 50 50, and it's not always necessarily like that. So uh, I would just love to learn a little bit, like from a maybe a day to day aspect, like how you balance um, all of those responsibilities. I have the skin in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know what? I'm a very structured person. Um, and me and my husband laugh all the time about it, you know, because when he's in his element, um, I remember the feeling and it is infectious. It, it is contagious. Um, I just ask for structure. As long as I have structure, I can rock and roll from there. As long as my calendar is up to date, you know, I can figure it out. If your mind can go and your body can go, you're ahead of the game. Um, and so the way I was able to learn to do it, the way I knew I was ready to be a wife, the way I knew I was ready to run a company was through coaching. As a head coach, 90% of the things that you end up doing have nothing to do with your sport. And so when you're able to delegate and learn how to deal with it, dump it or delegate it, let me say that again, deal with it, dump it or delegate it. We try so hard to have control of everything. You have people on staff for those reasons. Right. So at this point, take the pride hat off and make the main thing the main thing. And that's what I've learned to do. My family will always be my main thing. Always. Can I be honest in saying and coaching at some point or another, did I have to question myself on that? 100%. When the hours become unbearable to the point that you are either not waking your child or putting them to sleep, something has to go. It has to get. That is when you hear me talk about non-negotiables. If people are not paying into or pouring into, it's not a priority. If you want the team to be better, but you're an alumnus that won't write a check, 
you're not pouring into and paying into the end product, right? Therefore, I can't make it a priority. You can't want a million dollar product from me, but then we don't have it in the bank. And so that's what I, yeah, that's what I had to do to balance it. I'm like, hey, if this is taking out of the checking account, nobody wants to write a bad check. So I have to dump it or delegate it. And um, I do what I can do. You know, I have a really good team. Um, Running a nonprofit is tough. Let me say that. We are donation-based. We are grant-based. I have a staff that I pay to make things go. Um, And it's not always easy because people aren't very familiar with the nonprofit world. But I say this to say, everything that I do from a $10 donation on goes directly to serving and pouring back. And so I wanted to do that because once I found the balance in my life, I realized so many people need help. They really need help to the kid that only needed $1,000 to pay their final bill to graduate or to the collegiate programs who have walk-ons, who have outstanding bills and they're an integral part of your end result, but they can't play because they can't pay the bill. I was tired of talking to coaches about those scenarios. I wanted to be the person that helps or the single mom who's trying to get back on her feet, needs to be clothed, needs to be housed. Well, you know what? I can now do that in a servant capacity. So I had to be forced to find my balance, but I'm going to be honest with you. It feels really good. It does. Yeah. Yeah. That That's awesome. And, and I would love for, can you tell us uh, for the, the listening audience, I, I've done a lot of research and I know, but uh, just more about your foundation, how we can get more involved, where we can learn more about it and everything. Yes. My social media channels are at coach underscore J K Huff, H U F F. Um, please reach out to me, DM me if you have someone that either needs help or are willing to pour into guys. We're, we're only as good as the people that help and sponsor us. So what the foundation is, it's education and empowerment. It's really that simple. Yes, there's motivational speaking and all those things come under that for sure. But there's really no platform that we're not willing to take on. Um, we're here to serve at the end of the day. So Kern's Closet is located in Nashville, Tennessee. If you have gently used items from suits to athletic apparel that we know we can launder and get to people, that's what we do. Um, simply go to jessicakernfoundation.com. We are looking and taking applicants for families that need help. And again, we're just here to serve. And then the last component of that is Kern's commitment and that's property management. And that is certain buying certain properties and putting families in need in those properties to help get them back on their feet. So when people say, you're not working anymore, yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> but again, it's all in the servant capacity. So I am genuinely and humbly from the bottom of my heart asking um, if you're looking to give to somewhere, if you're looking to give to something that again is a tax write-off for you, Look at the Jessica Kern Foundation. Um, we're here to help. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to throw all that information into the show notes. So real easy. If you're not driving, not working out, tap the phone, open it up and yeah. check out the, the website and get involved. So uh, <laughs> Jessica, I really can't thank you enough for taking the time here today. I am feeling as energized as I anticipated I was going to be uh, coming into this. I am sure the listeners are going to have that same feeling after listening to this as well. So thank you so much for taking the time today and certainly wish you all the best with the move and getting reacclimated and and just really looking forward to everything that you and your family have coming for you. Thank you. The only thing I ask of you is let, let's follow up, you know, let's, let's see how this thing hits and what people may want to hear. Um, and let's, let's do it again. We are, you got me. Yes. <laughs> All day. Thank you. All right. See ya. <laughs>